good game. I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. This week on the show, we're either up high on rooftops or deep down in catacombs. No middle ground for us. That's right, Hex. We're living our digital lives to the very extremes. From the parkour playground of Mirror's Edge Catalyst... <laughs> ...to a monster hunt in The Witcher 3's final DLC, Blood and Wine. Geralt won't ever be gone for good, though, because he'll live on forever in my heart. Mm. Speaking of heartthrobs, Nick Boy tries his hand at running an adventurer's shop in a first play and Goose goes out to meet another budding Aussie indie dev. Now, you'll notice I've left my knees exposed. Yes, I'm definitely no However, I'm taking note of that. Oh, no! Oh, there is such a wealth of talent in Australia at the moment and he's only 15 years old. Yeah, amazing. When I was 15, all I was doing was looking at Buffy forums. Yeah, it was all sulking and Nine Inch Nails for me. <laughs> well, let's get started. Can you name the game for this week? Lattice Morissette was my 90s. <laughs> Got guests. Careful. By the crane, villains ready your arms! This is Geralt of Rivia. He's back. It's been a year since The Witcher 3 was released and we took on the wild hunt. Well, now developer CD Project Red are ready to say goodbye to old mate Geralt with one final adventure, Blood and Wine. This is no ordinary DLC. Blood and Wine is huge. With a whole new area of the map to explore, a new main storyline and heaps of secondary quests and Witcher contracts to complete, there's weeks of witchering in this. Yeah, this is seriously generous. The devs has said that this is it for the trilogy, so you can tell they wanted to go out on a high note. The story kicks off with Geralt responding to a call for help. To hunt a mysterious beast, of course. Got it. For an aristocrat dies. At best, it's a scandal. At worst, a diplomatic incident. And before you know it, you're in an all-new region called Toussaint. This is a picturesque and wealthy realm known for its fine wines, charming royalty, and, you know, Monsters. <laughs> ah, I'd almost forgotten how good the combat and creatures are in this game, Hex. And you're thrown right into it with this DLC, facing off against a rather irritated giant. The fights always have such a good flow. Switching between sword moves and using your signs is a delightful dance with death. <laughs> It took me a while to get to grips with it all again. Yeah, and you need to be in top form because everything in Toussaint is really high level. There are savage centipedes, fire-breathing slithers, and as Geralt discovers on his quest, higher vampires. We don't have to fight. You are wrong. He seriously got his work cut out for him on this quest and I was instantly pulled into the story. The new characters are great. The fearless Duchess, Anna Henrietta. Your Highness, I... Mind it doesn't get wrinkled. <laughs> and the mysterious death laugh. If I understand you correctly, you would rather help a monster than kill it. I mean, they're all really interesting, and you can tell there's so much going on that you'll need to uncover. Yeah, this isn't just a beast hunt. It's more of a grand murder mystery, and I love playing detective. They make it so much fun. Geralt's always needing to search for clues or do some kind of tracking. Footprints made by soiled boots. And I love those bits where he examines a corpse. Something in the throat. Nilfgaardian Florins from several different provinces. If the murderer did this, it means we're dealing with a sentient thinking beast. Yeah, it's like CSI Witcher style. Yeah, he's just so knowledgeable. I'm also glad that you can turn off that fisheye effect when you use his Witcher sense now, because that had always bugged me. They've made so many improvements with the massive patch that came with this DLC. Oh, the whole UI is so much better now, especially those customised map markers. Plus, now you can dye your armour. It's fun trying out fancy new colours, although I wish they were a bit more outlandish. They're a bit muted. I and mean, there are amazing costumes all over Toussaint, though. Colourful armour, fancy frocks, 
I recall her always being rather possessive. Lots of peacock feathers everywhere. You know, the Witcher has never been afraid of offsetting all of the monster slaying with a bit of fabulous, and I love that. And there's just so much detail in everything. The castle's hex. Oh, don't even get me started, Bajo. Beauclair is a beautiful capital. In fact, everything in this new region is so magical, I just took screenshot after screenshot. Screenshot. I think the game actually runs smoother and looks better on the console versions now too. Although the loading did feel a little bit longer to me, so maybe there's a small price to pay there. You can also own your own home in this DLC. Yes, Corvo Bianco. Geralt's very own estate, complete with vineyard that you can decorate and upgrade. Somewhere to hang all your spare armor sets and knickknacks. You even get a servant, Barnabas Basil Faulty. Basil? Basil! Another new feature in Blood and Wine is the addition of mutations. You'll need to complete a quest to unlock this ability set, but it essentially adds a new tree of perks to further flesh out what you're already capable of. And I like it because it adds another layer to what was already a pretty deep system. Yeah, I like that mutations unlock extra ability slots too. It's all geared towards making Geralt even more powerful than he was before, which you really need in Blood and Wine because, like we said, Toussaint is a highly dangerous place. If you love a hand or two of Gwent, there's a new Skelga deck, which has some powerful new minions and Kraken Crate as the leader card. But you will need to hunt around to find all the best cards. Yeah, I like that they made a whole quest line out of building your deck. In fact, there are a number of quests in this game that have multiple parts, and I just love that. One has you helping a massive building project erect a giant wonder, and then there's that hermit who tasks you with passing five tests of virtue in order to claim a sword. By one who possesses the five chivalric virtues. Folk call me a lot of things, but virtuous? I don't know. I just... I can't see myself putting this down until i finished all of it. All of it, Bajo. Yeah, they don't do anything by halves, do they, CD Projekt Red? And I love that they just put as much care into their side quests as they do the main story. I know, it just makes the whole world so rich and rewarding to explore. It's so impressive. And if you like getting sidetracked like I do, then be prepared to be kept very, very busy. The dressings, bandages. What's that about? I find it so hard to go past one of those question marks on the map without finding out what it is. And it's usually something I have to run away from. Damn it. Blood! Blood! But I will clear them all. Yes. Now, obviously, I'm already a big fan of this franchise, but what this DLC does is just reconfirm what an incredible game The Witcher 3 is at its core. I mean, what else is there to say other than this is the perfect add-on to the perfect game? I'm super sad this trilogy is coming to an end. I'm giving this five out of five. Yeah, it's so rare to be this excited about a DLC, and it's rare to find DLC that gives so much. So I'm giving Blood and Wine five out of five as well. Still kind of strange. You cross the ocean when I call sometimes, but then get hung up on the tiniest fence. What's that about? Uh, what can I say? Everyone's got limits. And now here's Nick Boy with the first play. Shopkeep is a new management sim that's just come out of early access for the PC. Now, I say it's a management sim, but it's also a cool twist on a fantasy RPG. In an RPG, you would normally play as, say, a barbarian who wanders across the lands killing monsters, and then you go to a shop to buy health pots. In Shopkeep, you play as the shopkeep, so you sell all those health pots to the barbarians. And instead of fighting monsters, all you're fighting is inflation. So let's jump in and take a look. Do I have a reflection? I'm hideous! Why? You would never trust anything sold by that man. Look, look in here. Look in here. Look at my shop. Wait, I'm looking for leather belts. Well, can I interest you in an overpriced health potion? This is the front. Get in, shoe, shoe, inside. Nah. Why is nothing easy running a business? Oh, 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 oh! Hello, sir. Hi, welcome. I'm the overbearing shopkeep. What did you say to me? <laughs> Terrific. 
I really love the fact that it's such a good twist on something that we're quite familiar with. We've all bought stuff from shopkeepers in stores and half the time I know for me I'm so angry at the prices that they set. Either everything's too expensive or they don't want to pay for the things that I've given them. So I love the fact that we've switched that and now I'm in that other position. And also it just allows you to instantly start role playing. And I love games where you can dive in and there's not a huge amount of story but you start imbuing everything into it. And here, I instantly started role-playing as a kind of grumpy shopkeeper. Should have used one of those health potions. It starts off quite slow, it, it takes a while, you have a bit of money, you can buy a couple of health pots and you actually need to buy and sell and buy and sell and buy and sell a decent amount so that you can start buying other pieces of equipment that will sell for more money. I've already bought a table and I've put a very nice sword on there and I'm ready for someone to run in and steal it from me. Did you, are you stealing? Are you stealing from me? What was that about? As you sell more items, you also start leveling up so you can start putting points into a skill tree because it is actually an RPG. And uh, something I leveled up was I get more money every time I sell something. So that meant that I could actually put products at a level that's a little less than I would actually want to make as a profit because I know I've got that stat that's giving me 20% extra gold for everything I sell. It's like fantasy GST. But I think my customers are appreciating my lower prices. And speaking of customers, they all have their own needs and I really like that. Some of them want wooden pants, some of them want shields, some of them want health potions, some of them don't know what they want. And then I have to kill them. It's a dangerous world. I also like that I got the anxiety of running a small shop. I, and I got a huge amount of delight the first time I sold something and I actually made a profit. Hello friend, how's your day going? Hey? How? Yes? He Oh my goodness, he bought it all! The systems in the game are quite unintuitive. Oftentimes I'm not sure how I'm supposed to be doing something. And then you can go into the tutorials, but the tutorials are all quite dense text-based ones. And they more talk about the theme of what you're doing rather than saying, this is the button you need to press to do this. You do figure it out, but it's not sort of the easiest way into the game. You kill someone, you get a fine. You start selling things that people like, more and more people are gonna come here. And the more you invest into the personality of the shopkeeper, the more fun you're going to have here. I sold at such a loss at the beginning. Okay, so can I buy more now? Oh, it's getting into me. Because the more you embrace the role of the shopkeep, then the more fun you are going to have. Because I do think it's a funny game, but it relies on you really buying into the concept. Oh! I told mum and dad to be successful. They did not believe me when I told them that I was going to make a great shop in a fantasy game. So that was my first play of Shopkeep. Will there be a second play? Yes, because I need to sell this sword or the bank's gonna take my house. Well, now it's time to meet another bright light on the indie dev scene. Yes, Q McFarlane started making his first game when he was 12 and it was a huge hit at PAX last year. Let's check it out. Okay, Q, so this is your bedroom. Is this officially your office? Yeah, you could call it that. Cool. So now you've got rivalry. What's the best way to describe it? Rivalry is a turn-based ragdoll fighting game where you move your limbs around and your weapons to attack the other opponents and defend. However, taking note of that. observe that was the point all along. Oh, no. Yeah. As I remove my leg and swing it back. Oh, no. <laughs> When I first kind of thought of the idea, I didn't know how to program fully, but I would mainly play Little Big Planet, and I loved that because it had its own little, um, you can make your own little programs sure. and make your own little games. And I thought, I'll try and make it in Little Big Planet. And I invited my friends over and we had a lot of fun. How did you go from that model into actually building a finished game? I remember my 
dad came in and I told him, hey, I have this idea. And I was thinking, you know, maybe you could help me try to build it as an actual game. And he mm -hmm. said, okay. And we played it and he thought, yeah, you know, this could work. So then he taught me how to use C Sharp and um, Visual Studios. We then got uh, the Unity engine and he started teaching me the architecture of how to program. And then from that, I would go in and I would kind of work out how to fix solutions. And then he would come in and maybe say how I could optimize things. Definitely useful to have a dad who actually understands how computers work. Do you guys play any other games together at all? He buys games and then I just sometimes like, sit there and watch. And, really? Yeah, for example, um, Dark Souls 3, oh. basically. <laughs> He plays the game and I sit there with my phone going through all like, the secrets, like, you know, how to get through it properly with yeah, that Yeah, okay, right. You know, oh, Dad, there's a skeleton around the corner. He's like, oh, okay, good, thank you. Right, so it's usually the other way around in most sort of father-son relationships. You'd have, like, you know, the dad playing catch-up, but in this case, you're watching your dad play one of the most brutally difficult games of all time. And it's so fun watching it. Now, this isn't the first game you've made. What other stuff have you done? One of my first ever apps I made was a simple name generator where you're just, it's a simple yellow background, two names, you click on it and it just creates two random names and it's very crazy and a bit out there. Simple, that's the one thing that I think people liked about it was that it was very simple. Another game that was when I was kind of first had the Unity engine and I was kind of looking at how things worked. So I just decided, okay, I'm just gonna get all these different images. I got Santa Claus and what he does is he shoots out cats in a cave that go into a vortex and stop meteors. My friends have a you know, play of it and they would think, oh man, this is crazy and I love it. So from that I went, okay, yeah, I can kind of see how this all works. My dad, uh, he, he kind of said, hey, there's this thing called PAX. There's an indie area, you can, you can get a stand. And then from that I got a Kickstarter and people funded my Kickstarter and we got enough money to go to Melbourne, get a stand. And I remember when we first got in there, of course, um, Fallout 4 was there. As soon as the doors opened, everyone just was going straight down the aisle and sh straight into Fallout 4. And after a little bit of cool down, all of a sudden people started just emerging, looking at my game, wondering about it, and then coming and having a little play. This isn't Fallout 4, but I'll try this as yeah. well. <laughs> Other people came, it started, you know, growing more and more until we had this massive amount of people just crowded around watching. And it's also yeah. a good spectator sport. And people would like, look at the monitors and just be like, you know. Totally. What, you what was it like to be around other indie developers as well, who obviously might have a bit more experience due to their age? Before the um, whole event would start, mm -hmm. everyone would like kind of come together, you know, they would walk around each other's stands, have a little play before, you know, everyone came in and just took the stands away. Yeah. From that, we would talk about things. They treated me, you know, as a developer and it was, you know, we had good talks. How do you find time to make a game when you're in the middle of year nine or ten at school? Whenever I get an assignment, I'll try to work on that as fast as I can, but I'll try, you know, make it so it looks good. Yep. And then once I finish that assignment and I have free time, I'll work on the game. Do you have any free time outside of that? In the afternoons, this is basically my life, but <laughs> in the mornings I'm allowed to do whatever I want, wake up early, watch my favourite YouTubers, you yeah. know, play games. Hey guys, it's Kim here and welcome to Rivalry. I am joined by my never-ending rival, Duncan. One of the weird things is that one of my favourite YouTubers that I watch, they did a Let's Play of it and I yeah. was like, oh my, <laughs> I was very surprised by it. <laughs> I just want to cut you! So that was great coverage, we got a lot of publicity, a lot of people came in and had a look and yeah, it was a good boost. <laughs> Screw it, just lurch. <laughs> 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 You're gonna drown me in your blood, kid. I feel I'm gonna continue working on it for as soon as I think it's finished and I've done everything with it. Mm. I'm planning to add a few features like online multiplayer, sharing and making it look a bit prettier, polishing it. I'm gonna try get it fully released on Steam by this year. That's my number one thing I want to kind of work on is game developer. Yeah. I feel that I want to keep indie though. I'm not looking at being a part of like one of the AAA sort of okay. game companies. That's kind of because I feel like I have more freedom and you can do what you want, you know, there's yeah. no boundaries and that sort of stuff. It's definitely fun and like, you know, I like doing it. Yeah. So, yeah. If you've um, if you've noticed <laughs> <laughs> if I put my head down, sort up, sort around. There we go. Maybe if I just bleed there all over we you. Go. Oh no. Oh I put um. <laughs> It's been eight years since the first Mirror's Edge made a name for itself with its unique first-person parkour and clean futuristic stylings. And now we finally have a sequel. Well, it's more of a reboot, really, with Mirror's Edge Catalyst.
The original Mirror's Edge definitely earned a cult following back in the day, but it didn't sell that well, which would explain why it's taken so long for a new one to get a green light. It was a brave experiment and a bit of a risk for a big publisher like EA and a big developer like DICE. It had promising original gameplay, although it never really felt like it hit its full potential and it came out with mixed reviews. So that's why it's so exciting for DICE to have another crack at it. Well, now we're back in the shoes of Faith who has just been released from prison and soon finds herself tangled up with her old runner friends. I'm Icarus. Noah sent me. Breaking the law and running on lots of stuff. Time to get off the ground. Yes, the world is controlled by the conglomerate who lord over a dystopian society where everyone has to get a special implant which makes sure they get a job and contribute to society. If you do not find employment within 14 days, you'll be relocated to a Greenland facility. Do you understand? <laughs> <laughs> So groups of runners subvert authorities by running on rooftops and delivering things the old-fashioned way, without the help of brain mail or drones and free from the prying eyes of Big Brother. And just like the first game, most of what you do involves running over things, under things, onto things, around things, and generally just moving a lot. This is all about finding the quickest path and keeping up that momentum. And the movement system is excellent. You pretty much have one button to go up and climb and one button to slide and go down. But depending on things like whether you hold them down, how you time them and the direction you're moving, you can pull up different moves. It really is a simple but effective control scheme and it just makes you feel like a free-running boss. It's one of the few things that hasn't changed at all. You wouldn't think it would be as compelling as it is, but I just find it so hard to put down. Just one more run. Yeah, absolutely. There is one thing that's a bit different now, and that's skill trees, which you upgrade with XP. One each for movement, combat, and gear. It does seem a little odd at first that some basic and essential moves, like a roll, for example, which helps you keep speed after a big jump, are locked away. I mean, isn't it weird that a free-running legend like Faith needs to unlock the ability to roll? Yeah, what, did she just forget? Yeah, she just suddenly, oh yeah! Oh yeah, she just tripped over and rolled it. Oh, that's right, I can do that. <laughs> it's not a deal-breaker, though. You'll unlock it fairly quickly, and I never felt hamstrung by the lack of skills or moves outside of that. It seems like half of the skills are unlocked from the start anyway, and most of the upgrades are just improved improvements, like more health or the ability to climb things faster. Yeah, that's true, and I do always enjoy having a few upgrades and abilities to work towards in a game. One new big thing is that this is set in an open world now, and I find that really exciting. It's a great direction for this game to go in. There are a few fairly big interconnected hubs that you unlock as you progress, and this makes everything far less linear, with plenty of paths to explore. And as you progress, you get some new bits of gear to play with, like a grapple hook you can swing from. Faith, you need to go across Turing Avenue. Or the ability to pull down planks blocking your way. And these open up some new areas in old ones to give you new ways to get around. It took about 10 hours to get through this, I think, just focusing mostly on the main story missions, but there is a lot to keep you busy here as well if you're a completionist. The areas are well designed too. They're all fun to run around in. And there's also lots of collectibles to find and side missions to do. I love how they all feel unique, but they still fit into this clean, homogenized world. Yeah, I do love the design of everything. Come on home. The corporation clearly has a big thing for clean, minimalistic architecture and bright, cohesive color schemes. You'll be in big trouble if you want to put up some red curtains in the purple zone. It's like if the world of Blade Runner was full of super clean freaks who were also super anal about color theory. <laughs> there are a few points, though, where the design does feel a bit gamey. Like, who thought this pipe should go here? The only reason you'd put that pipe there is if the whole world was full of people who love sliding under stuff. Well, that is the world they live in. I know what you mean, though. You can tell they've tried really hard to make this world feel a little bit more believable and lived in with NPCs kind of going about their lives. But it still all feels just a little bit removed from you somehow. The occasional NPC stands around, but it will just blankly stare at you and won't react to your presence at all, while most people are generally tucked away safely behind glass. Maybe it's trying to symbolise that those people are like animals trapped in the zoo of modern society, shackled down by their own employment. It's very deep of you, Bajo. Still waters run deep, Hanks. <laughs> I do feel like this world is so purposefully designed, though, that I started to develop this leap-before-you-look mentality. I just started to assume that there was always going to be a thing for me to jump onto. And often, there is not. You'll go berserk, I'm sure. We've had this discussion once already. <laughs> yeah, and there's quite a long load time to get back into the game after you die, on Xbox One at least. <laughs> Which 
sucks because it breaks the flow of everything. Yeah, that was a real pain point for me. One of the major criticisms of the original game was that Faith could disarm enemies and use their guns. And that kind of went against everything that made Mirror's Edge so unique. Yeah, well, now there's none of that. In fact, the guns in this game are biometrically programmed to its user only, so she couldn't even pick up the guns if she wanted to. Now she just has to rely completely on her trusty fists and feet. And I think that was the right direction to take, but I'm not sold on this combat. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a mixed bag, isn't it? I mean, I can see what they were going for, but it just doesn't work a lot of the time. I mean, generally you're encouraged to always be on the move, launching attacks off walls or quickly brushing off enemies as you make a run for it. Yes, and once you've built up enough speed and strung together a few moves, you build up a focus shield, which basically makes you invulnerable to bullets and attacks. And I think in those situations where you can keep that momentum up and string together attacks, that's when the combat works and it's really satisfying, but there just aren't enough opportunities to do that. Yeah, I mean, more often than not, you find yourself in small rooms with a few guys to deal with where there often isn't a lot of opportunity to get up speed or pull off fancy moves. I mean, those are the situations where it starts to feel really clunky and underwhelming. Yeah, you're encouraged to kick enemies into each other or objects, which often causes them to stumble or just die. But it just looks a bit ridiculous watching two guys stumble into each other and fall over. doesn't really have the impact that that sort of thing needs. Yeah, it's really awkward, isn't it? While this is mostly a single player only game, there are a few online features which is nice to see. For example, there are billboards around the place that you can hack which will show up in your friends' games. But best of all are the custom made time trials. You'll find these all over the place and it's easy to create your own ones as well. I love that stuff. It's always tempting trying to topple your friends' times. <laughs> oh, what about the story? What did you think of that? It's a bit of a slow burn, isn't it? It wasn't until the second half that I started to feel particularly invested and interested in what was going on. My orders were to capture them, but they resisted. What did you do? We had to shoot! But overall, I thought it had some good twists and turns. The cutscenes look great, and there's some solid performances as well. You can see yourself out. Wait, what? That's it? What else is there? What did you think of it? Yeah, I mean, things got quite interesting towards the end. One thing they do do a lot of, though, is talk to you over the radio, which is often used quite effectively in games, but I just found it really hard to focus on here. Again? Now what? Sorry, but the less you know, the better. It's just really hard to concentrate in running and not falling to my death and listen to what they're saying. I'm running the goddamn zoo. Come talk to me when you're done, Faith. Yeah, it just becomes white noise after a while, doesn't it? What are you giving it overall, Hicks? Well, the combat does drag it down a lot, but the story and the striking design and that excellent running just pulled me through. So I'm giving it three and a half out of five. There is a lot to like. The running, the open world stuff was great, but I don't think they've cracked the formula yet for the series. So I'm giving it three out of five. So tell me, dear viewers, did you name the game for this week? Or did you not? It was Pinball Fantasies for PC from 1992. Featuring four themed pinball tables, this simulation boasted 256 colour graphics and sound. And it was a follow-up to the semi-successful Pinball Dreams. And it's unnamed the game because it was developed by DICE, the same studio behind this week's Mirror's Edge Catalyst. Humble beginnings, Barjo. Next week on the show, you won't be here because thanks to the magic of television, you're technically already over at E3 in Los Angeles right now. That's right, Hex, and Goose is with me. We'll be bringing back an hour-long E3 special and we're also doing a daily show, which you can catch online. Who's going to keep my seat warm while I'm gone, Hex? Well, it's the ever-insightful Nick Boy. We're going to get stranded on an alien planet in the Solus Project and solve a mystery or two in Sherlock Holmes, The Devil's Daughter. Plus loads of shenanigans, I'm sure. Well, until next time, Bajo out. Hex out. Do you want me to bring you back anything from LA? Yes, just loads of gross American chocolate and lollies. OK. Sure. Stuff with peanut butter in it, because they put peanut butter in everything. Yeah, why do they do that? It's gross. Leave peanut butter on toast and maybe celery, and that's it. Don't put it in my chocolate. No, I'm happy with peanut butter to sneak into, like, other things. What it? Put it 
growing from... celery? That's so old school. Yeah, that's great. Why do you, when you put peanut butter on fruit. 